Hello and welcome to another Redis Tech Talk. Today we'll be looking at caching, one of the fundamental technologies behind any modern application. We've divided today's session into three parts. First, Justin Castilla, a developer advocate here at Redis, will take us through the basics of caching. Next, we'll have a short interview with Lee Atchison, noted author of Caching at Scale with Redis, who will talk about how to figure out how effective caching will be for your applications. And we'll wrap up with a customer story as Prasanjit Singh of Stars Play goes through their growing pains and ultimate success as they went from 10,000 customers to 100,000 to 2 million. So let's get started. Here's Justin Castilla to talk about what caching is and how it works. So what is caching? According to our old friend Wikipedia, a cache is a hardware or software component that stores data so that future requests for that data can be served faster. The data stored in a cache might be the result of an earlier computation or a copy of data stored elsewhere. As an example, when you log into Twitter, you're greeted with a long list of tweets from the users you follow. The list you see has been created beforehand and cached, rather than gathered and assembled on the spot. This ensures a great user experience. Essentially, when your backend systems aren't as fast as you'd like them to be, a cache gives you a holding pen for quick retrieval and thus a faster response time. Response time refers to the amount of time, usually in milliseconds, that an application takes to respond to a user interaction. When caching is part of your architecture, you can often reduce response times from hundreds of milliseconds to less than a millisecond. At the same time, you're reducing the load in your backend services and getting more from your existing hardware. And most importantly, your users will benefit from faster interactions with your application. So now that you know what caching is and why it's important, let's look how a cache fits in your system architecture and let's also review a basic caching algorithm. The backend receives a request and then queries a disk-based data store to retrieve the necessary records. Let's say that each request takes around 75 milliseconds to fulfill. This might not seem like a long time, but remember, this is just one backend request. It's often necessary to make multiple requests to render a given view in an application. 75 milliseconds doesn't give us much wiggle room, especially if we're under load. If we ever need to scale, or if we're lucky enough to go viral, the extra load will add up, creating bottlenecks, blocking, and high latency. And remember, latency is the new outage. Enter the cache. In this case, our cache is a Redis database. Redis stores its entire data set in memory, which makes it an ideal choice for caching. Imagine taking that initial 75 milliseconds response time and reducing it to less than a millisecond. That's quite an improvement. Now when our application receives a request, it first quickly checks the cache to see if that data is already at hand. If so, great, we call this a cache hit. We can send the data back to the user right away rather than accessing the original data store. If the data is not in the cache, we call this a cache miss. We then process the request to the original backend data store as normal. This is a great opportunity though. After adding the result of this request to our cache, subsequent requests result in a cache hit and a much faster response time. So caching is useful in a number of situations and it dramatically decreases your application response time. What's the downside? Well, one challenge of caching is staleness. At some point, your cache is no longer going to represent the system of record. This is known as cache staleness. The strategies to prevent a stale cache depend on your use case, but in simple terms, they boil down to passive versus active cache expiration. We can set a TTL on each cache entry to passively clear out cache. TTL means time to live and it usually is measured in seconds, minutes, or hours. It's like setting an expiration date. After a defined amount of time, the data will be automatically deleted, ensuring we do not store outdated information forever. We could also actively update the cache by replacing existing entries with newer, fresh versions taken from the system of record. This is known as cache busting. It's worth considering whether you really need to add a cache. For certain services, it might make sense to make Redis itself the system of record. This way, the data is always served from memory. And if you take advantage of Redis's persistence and high availability features, you can ensure that your data is still safe and available. 
So that's a great overview of caching, but how do you know how effective your cache is likely to be? I recently interviewed Lee Atchison, the author of the excellent book, Caching at Scale with Redis, available for free on the Redis website. Lee explained what you need to think about when you're considering adding a cache to your application. Could you talk a little bit about the considerations there uh, as I determine whether or not a cache is a good idea? Sure, sure. You know, it's it's actually a reasonable assumption to be thinking about uh, expensive things are good candidates for caching, but there really are three things that matter for determining whether or not uh, cache is uh, um, uh, reasonable and or effective. And that is one, how expensive is the operation that you're trying to cache? Right. Two, how expensive is the cache lookup itself relative to the expense of the operation of that you're trying to perform? Right. It doesn't help to cache something at the, the time it takes to look up the cache is almost the same as it takes to do the operation itself. So right. those the comparison of those two numbers is really important. And the third thing is the percent of requests that are likely to hit the cache versus miss the cache. So if you think about the way you typically use a cache is you check the cache, see if it has the value you need. And if not, you go and do the backend operation. Right. Well, the percent of times that that request the cache finds the value you need and returns it is called the hit rate. And the higher the hit rate, the more efficient the cache is. But if you end up hitting the cache all the time and keep missing and having to go back and do the back end calculation anyway, you're actually spending more time than if you just went ahead and did the back end calculation and forgot about the cache. So it really matters not only how expensive those two operations are, but the ratio between hit and miss. And, uh, and, and comparing those numbers together, you can determine whether or not it's, a, it's appropriate to have a cache and if it is appropriate, how efficient and what, you know, what the efficacy of the cache is. Right. And we have a whole chapter that talks about that in this book in great detail, goes through the math and shows you the tipping points where you really can make a solid determination as to whether a cache is appropriate or not in a given situation. Now that we've talked about caching and how it works, let's hear from someone caching with Redis in the real world. At RedisConf 2021, Prasanjit Singh of Stars Play talked about their experiences with caching as their business grew. Stars Play is a video on demand service that grew from 10,000 users to more than 2 million. We had growth in number, we had growth in traffic. And that is when we saw our first challenge. Well, uh, what was that? High response time. In simple words, a slow application, which meant a not so good user experience. It meant timeouts, retries, errors resulting um, out of this slowness. And uh, we were digging into uh, like uh, the reason, why was that? Uh, so let's understand the situation. Uh, to do that, let's uh, revisit the stack. If you look at this diagram, uh, you see a simple three-tier architecture with a presentation layer, uh, with a web portal, mobile and TV apps, and uh, application layer um, uh, of microservices with a designated function, and finally a database layer, the single source of truth for our system. The problem here is uh, when you have traffic in high numbers, then the database would get overwhelmed with requests exceed connection limits, breach disk I.O. and would eventually uh, lead to slowness uh, or outage. The solution is a cliche, using a cache. And what we did, we did just that. We uh, put up a Redis cache over there. And so our application now would uh, look something like this. The application would check a cache uh, for data and would retrieve it from the cache if it's present there or else fetch it from the database and update the cache. This uh, reduced unnecessary network overhead and stress on the DB. Now, cache memory uh, temporarily stores the most frequent used data, and it's a great way to get that data that is used most often because the retrieval process is super fast. However, cache memory is limited in size, and there needs to be a way to manage what data needs to be removed and uh, 
you know, from the cache uh, so that uh, th we, we would have space uh, for new data to come in. That's where LRU cache uh, comes in. It's a cache replacement algorithm that removes the least recently used data to make room for new data. So we uh, did this and some other tweaks on the server side uh, and finally we we're able to resolve the problem. It's always great to hear a success story, but of course, sooner or later something will go wrong, such as cache failure. Prasanjit discussed that as well. Let me explain. You're using uh, Redis and your server goes down for some reason, or your disk fails, uh, even if the server is running your disk fails, and you have no high availability mechanism in place or you, you are a small startup, you cannot afford HA yet. So that leads to requests hammering your backend, your databases again. So how do you deal with that? Well, we are DevOps, so we have solutions to everything. We have uh, images of ready servers, ready uh, stored up in the cloud, so we can just spin up new servers in minutes. But uh, it isn't mm, that easy. That doesn't solve the problem actually. Why? Because new servers that spin up are clean slates, like their hard disks would not have the latest cache data. They would have the snapshots of images that uh, when you made them. So it would take minutes or sometimes hours for cache warming. So how did we solve this? Well, uh, Redis had an answer, AOF snapshots. Now what is that? Redis database persistence performs point-in-time snapshots of your data set at specified intervals. Now, AOF, uh, that stands for append-only file, uh, the AOF persistent logs write every operation received by the server that will be played again at uh, server startup. And uh, reconstructing the original data set, uh, it'll recreate everything that was logged in and recreate the original data set uh, from those snapshot logs. So even when we spin up new instances, we, we can restore the cache data. Another problem done understood. So it was that simple. Just have your AOF snapshots in there and uh, server goes down, spin up a new server, takes a couple of minutes and then restore your AOF snapshots and solve the problem. That's a great story of using persistent cache data to solve a problem. Luckily, Prasanja had another problem, success. High traffic uh, problems uh, are difficult to solve actually, because you know everything is right, but you need to have the capability for your stack to be elastic. In this case, uh, we needed our red stack to auto scale uh, on demand or whenever the load is high. So how does auto scaling work with Redis? Well, one way uh, to make auto scaling work with uh, Redis uh, is to use a horizontal pod auto scaler. That of course will work if your Redis cluster is on Kubernetes, and that automatically scales the number of pods uh, in a replication controller, uh, a deployment replica set or a stateful set based on the CPU utilization. You can also use uh, controllers like Maestro or Keda that can achieve this. So your cluster grows based on the traffic or CPU usage and uh, new nodes are added and it uh, shrinks back uh, when the loads subside. So uh, this is how we did it. Well, so that is where we stand at this moment. Uh, so can we say that um, the story ends and we lived happily ever after? I don't think so. Why? Uh, all I can say is uh, like we hit a wall at every step, learned something there, moved on to the next step and we grew. Uh, we kept growing and we continue growing and we are looking forward to what is coming. Probably next would be active, uh, active, active uh, geo replication cluster. Uh, we could have a uh, multi-cloud you know, replication, multi-tenant, infinite scaling and all those good features that Redis Enterprise has to offer. Well, that covers our look at caching. We started with the basics and looked at how to use a cache in an application. Then we heard about how to determine where caching makes sense. And for a storybook ending, we saw a customer story that used caching to improve performance, do disaster recovery, 
and handle high traffic growth. We hope you've enjoyed this session and keep an eye on our website for more Tech Talks. Thanks.